Ladies and gentlemen, before we start session third, water energy renewable interplay, um, we and Robert specifically wanted to uh, request from a dear friend economist, Mr. Joe Fadul, to give us a perspective on some of the main macroeconomic challenges uh, facing us in the region. And although this might be a little bit a, uh, uh, a more general topic than, and, and I would say, beyond energy, uh, it's a good transition before we start discussing the, the, the water-food nexus, water-food energy nexus, for which the panel uh, will be joining afterwards. So first, let us welcome Mr. Joe Fadul for his keynote on the topic. Uh, the next session will be on water, energy, and renewables. As you know, up to now, we have some water in Lebanon, but it should be better managed. We have no fossil energy, at least up to now, and the renewables are very timid. So needless to say that everybody here and in all non-oil producing countries, will be very happy to hear how a non-oil producing countries can face those uh, challenges. Thank you. So, um, Joe, if, you, if, if I can ask you a question in relation to uh, the topic of a G, uh, gross domestic product in, in the region and how you think uh, some of the challenges that are facing us uh, due to demography uh, okay. are affecting uh, the realization of our current plans. Okay. Well, one of the uh, surprising one of the surprising figures is that the balance of payment of a country like Saudi Arabia, which was largely in excess for some years, have had two years of deficit. The balance of payment of Kuwait is also dwindling. The balance of payment of Egypt is in deficit, but the deficit does not increase and when we consider what's going on in Egypt, GDP growth per year uh, averaging between 5 and 6 percent, which is very good. Uh, the project of the new gas pipeline, gas and oil pipeline between Egypt and Europe. Uh, the, the fact that the liquef liquefaction plant in Egypt will be used not only for the Egyptian gas, but also for the Cypriot gas. And more surprising, even Israel announced that it will liquefy its gas in Egypt, thus, uh, thus uh, uh, proving or uh, um, assuring the central role of Egypt in gas and energy for the next 10 years. This brings us to another question. I mean, uh, up to now, the center of oil and gas and also the center of the economy of the Middle East was in the Gulf countries, Saudi and the Gulf states. It seems that the new gas discoveries in Egypt, in Cyprus, and maybe in Lebanon, there will be some sort of displacement of uh, the energy production between the Gulf and the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. So this also has a side effect. It seems that in front of Iran, Egypt will be the counterbalance and not Saudi Arabia. Do you have uh, a view as to how current uh, efforts led 
by some of the countries in the region. We are talking, we will be discussing this afternoon uh, on the Egypt session about the uh, program to reform the oil and gas sector and as well as attract more investment and also to regulate the gas industry. Uh, is there a need for more regulation in order to facilitate economic development? Well, what, what I can say about Lebanon is that the solution we found is not the best one. The best one would have been, like in Algeria, to have a national uh, oil company for which uh, the role would be to absorb the technology and the management techniques and to gradually take in charge uh, the whole exploitation of the oil and gas resources. While what we have done up to now is practically uh, the, the, the opposite. No national oil company and no perspective of uh, managerial and uh, technical uh, transfer of uh, know-how. Uh, one more question on uh, the water resources. Uh, we, uh, we were discussing earlier that there are some um, major challenges, uh, and we will be discussing it uh, in, the, in the session later on, uh, talking about the uh, Turkish dams on the, uh, the rivers of Euphrates and Tigris, but also the Nile, uh, uh, the Nile uh, water uh, subject. Uh, how are we, uh, given our dependence on uh, hydrocarbon in the GCC and also uh, the difficulty of managing water resources uh, facing the future when it comes to uh, the security of uh, agriculture, uh, both for, from an energy point of view, as you know, uh, uh, fertilizers are dependent on petrochemicals um, and as well as uh, uh, from the point of view of water resource management. Okay, well, obviously we are heading uh, towards some uh, political conflicts and problems. First, for the Nile, a country like Ethiopia, which is an emerging power in, in Africa, is uh, diverting and is planning to use more of the Nile water, which, which poses a problem for Egypt, and not to mention Sudan. Also, uh, the Turks uh, with the Euphrates are building dams on the Euphrates, and this will also pose some problem to, the, uh, to Syria. Uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, we we do have uh, problems with, I mean, one of the present uh, issues, for example, for the Bisri Dam, uh, between those who say that we shouldn't build it and those who say we, we, we should build it and we might have a uh, deficit in water in the next 10 or 15 years. So the water is obviously a problem. Fortunately enough, uh, in Lebanon, it's not a political problem with other uh, countries. It's only a, a local problem. But it's evident, and also it's evident, that when one and a half million uh, refugees pumping uh, the water chaotically in the Bika Valley, we have, uh, I don't know the name in English, La Nap Khayatik, which is uh, going uh, down, and uh, w which which is a problem for the, for the next uh, coming years. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister Fadal. I have a few observations on one on about oil, oil, the National Oil Company, and about water. I didn't, I didn't get whether you are in favor of a, of a, 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 a National Oil Company, well, definitely, this is a, this is a good thing to have. At, uh, I mean, as a matter of principle, yeah, this is that has to do with the sovereignty of the country and the right to really manage its own resources properly. But I think this is 
Well, as you as you can say, you may be wrong in being right too soon. Uh, too soon because uh, we don't have the financial resources for that, and we don't have the 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 uh, uh, the elements that can manage such a company. We have definitely a large number of personnel who are quite well well trained, well exposed, and so on. But to get them to work as as a group and form a national oil company, I think this is quite premature. It would require some years of further experience and further knowledge. And knowledge at the same time, making sure that we have the proven reserves that we need so that to create a national oil company. I'm afraid, I'm afraid now because the whole thing is being politicized and really run in, uh, run in a way to please this group and that group. As we discussed in the morning about the sovereign fund, that it is being discussed for that each group, each political group, each party, its militia, is trying to reserve a seat in that sovereign fund. The same thing, they want to reserve a seat in the National Oil Company. I think we need more time so that we have the state back, the state of Lebanon is back to be in charge, where it's being respected for its role and for its reputation and being really accepted by the people and they have confidence in the state, I think this is the time where we should have a national oil company. Well, on should... the other hand, on the other hand about water, I'd like to really say something in here. Definitely accept one, one, one river in Lebanon, which is Nahr Asi. Uh, it is a transboundary river. The, all the rest of the waters, yani, definitely Hasbani, yani, it's, uh, is another, but I mean, there are no plans to really uh, build dams on that, you see. I think in yani, the building dams, this is something that has to be studied very carefully because of lots of environmental factors. Huh? And uh, again, lots of education that has to be made because during this period, there has been an increasing level of corrupting the minds of the people about so many issues, about water, about solid waste, about uh, uh, sewage, about everything, you see. So that to really get to a state where we can really decide on these matters. You have mentioned something about, about the water table in the Bekaa Valley. The water table in the Bekaa Valley was really uh, uh, يعني, lots of uh, drawing water from, from this water table that it declined before the arrival of the Syrian refugees. Yeah. The water table became a problem in Lebanon, particularly in the Bekaa, much earlier than the coming of the Syrian refugees. And it has been polluted by, again, by uh, يعني, uh, mismanagement of the thing. What is required, actually, regarding water whether it is in Lebanon or in the Arab world, is better management. And at the same time, more better cooperation with the countries where we have transboundary water. Well, I suppose nobody will challenge that we need a state, a real state, and that we don't have it now. And this is maybe the origin of a lot of our present problems. This is sure. Thank you, Prime Minister Senora. Uh, I think we, we will now introduce the next uh, panel, unless if anybody else has a, a, a question. Concerning the uh, oil and gas in Lebanon, I uh, agree with uh, Joe concerning uh, the uh, involvement of the Lebanese themselves in the exploitation. Maybe <coughs> Prime Minister Senora is right when saying that we are not prepared for that. But we have to be pre prepared. We have to start something. We can't wait forever. Count on others. We have to prepare ourselves. We have to, our, first of all, uh, have a program in the, univer in the uh, universities concerning this uh, department. 
and uh, also to be prepared to have our own, our, our own responsibility duties concerning the exploitation. And mainly, it's not difficult to, to get the expertise from abroad, but we should be prepared and uh, to take it into consideration that at a certain stage we have to be responsible ourselves and not to wait forever because if we don't put this issue on the agenda, we will not uh, forever will not be any more prepared to, to have our national companies concerning the exploitation. It's the same for the telecommunication too. Unfortunately, we are so dependent on others and uh, without any kind of self -confidence. Thank you, President. Uh, actually, when we discussed uh, establishing a national oil company, uh, I was not, in my mind, I was not thinking about EGPC as a model, but more like ONIM in Morocco. In fact, uh, ONIM, which st stands for Office National des Hydrocarbures et des Mines, has been a quite a successful uh, light version of an NOC, which served uh, the purpose of what Morocco has been trying for the light, last uh, 20 years is to establish uh, vast resource discovery in the Atlantic. And uh, they oversaw at least 20 offshore wells drilled uh, for the period between uh, 1980s until even very recently. So, um, and they are keeping going. And, and one of the points that we should keep in mind is is for Lebanon to in, in, uh, engage efforts, sus uh, sustained efforts, and accelerate it toward a discovery. It might take more than one well. In fact, it might take several. And for that, a small version of a national oil company could be a good idea. I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Daniela Diegelman. Uh, she's the head of the regional program Energy Security and Climate Change MENA forecast. Uh, at Konrad Adenauer Schiftung, based in Rabat, Morocco. Uh, Daniela, if you can please come in. Uh, and then, please, if you can uh, keep in mind, Mr. Skolios is uh, having to catch a plane early, so he will be the first pa person to be questioned. So please go ahead. So welcome to our third session, Water, Energy and Renewables Interplay in the Middle East. Uh, I hope uh, it will be an energetic session because we just had lunch, so you might be a bit uh, tired, but we'll try to wake you up with our discussion. And uh, I think we'll have a trilingual, uh, a trilingual session, so uh, you might want to have your, at least I might want to have my headphones ready, so we'll have uh, interventions in English, French and Arabic. Um, we've already had basically two introductions. We had the introduction just now of Mr. Fadul, the introduction of Mr. Fadul, and also I think uh, the dinner, uh, not dinner, the lunch speech we uh, we heard of uh, Paul Stevens also already prepared us for our discussion that we're going to have now. Um, I will give a very brief uh, introduction. Uh, before um, our first panelist, uh, Michael Skolos, will speak, as you've heard, he has to catch a plane, so there will not be much time for a question. So if you have one, we can allow one uh, short question to him after his intervention, so keep thinking about it already now. Um, we'll be mainly talking about uh, water in terms of water energy food nexus. Um, so what is the panorama that we're facing? We have increasing um, water scarces, scarcity in the region. Uh, as we have discussed also, um, uh, all revenues are going down. We have unsustainable development as well as growing environmental concerns like pollution. We have uh, uh, 
um, the, the consequences of climate change, uh, like rising temperature and sea levels, desertification, extreme uh, weather, weather phenomena, uh, also increasing. So we want to discuss uh, the socioeconomic impact uh, of this, which could be either uh, internal displacement, but also in certain countries, a social contract that is based on subsidies uh, will uh, suffer if there are less uh, revenues to fund those subsidies. And um, in general, climate change is also going to be um, a threat multiplier. So we will be talking about water energy food nexus, about water security, uh, water diplomacy. We will also uh, address in um, our interventions. And um, <coughs> this panel is a bit of a merged panel. So besides water, we will also address uh, energy topics and renewable energies. Um, and... Um, we will talk about the future development and, and market shares compared with hydrocarbons, how uh, cleaner sources of energy um, for power generation or transport also can be supported. Uh, we'll try to have a look also on regulatory framework and financial infrastructure. And um, we invite all of you to join us in the discussion. So if some of the points we want to uh, address maybe are not addressed in depth as you think we should, then... You're free, of course, uh, to share your view with us. Um, without uh, further ado, I would like to pass to the first panelist, which is Professor Michael Skolos. He's a professor at the University of Athens in Greece, as well as director of the UNESCO Chair and Network on Management and Education for Sustainable Development in the Mediterranean, chairman of the Mediterranean Information Office for Environment, Culture and Sustainable Development. And I could go further. I just mentioned one. <laughs> we'll just mention one more, uh, which is the uh, chairman of the Global Water Partnership for the Mediterranean. So you will talk about uh, the water energy food nexus, give a yes. presentation, and then... You thank you very to... much, uh, Madam you. Chair, and I would like to thank uh, very much uh, His Excellency, the President, and also my friend uh, Fadi Komer for um, inviting me here uh, in this very distinguished uh, gathering. Um, I would like to make a link with uh, what it was said before, uh, particularly uh, by Professor Stevens. <clears throat> During the morning session, we had some pessimistic analysis and some optimistic analysis. And what we have to avoid is to have a paralysis through the analysis, because this is uh, where we are in many countries and many circles at the moment. And in fact, even if uh, some of our analyses uh, are pessimistic, we have to conduct policies in a very optimistic way. And uh, starting by that, uh, I would like to say that um, the optimism that uh, for 30, 40 years with the transition will have with us the fossil fuel as, more or less as we have it, is a very optimistic and misleading, I think, statement. Things change very, very, very rapidly, and they don't change only within the energy se sector. <clears throat> and actually, the nexus, the water, energy, food, ecosystem nexus, there are four components, and you have to see it as a tetrahedron, as a small pyramid, where policies have to be developed, taking into account simultaneously all this. When I say simultaneously, it doesn't mean 25% each. It might be five, three, but it has to be there in the design from the very beginning. And I say the ecosystem because uh, I participate in many meetings. We had the biodiversity meeting in uh, uh, Egypt recently where we heard that 70% of species disappeared in this generation. So we are talking about the erosion of our bases. And we cannot approach this with the same way as 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. 
we, are, we have in front of us a changing world, and this is understood by the society. And the society, unfortunately, will not say, okay, let's wait. They will move for immediate change, even if you have the bankruptcy of many sectors. And this is something we have to avoid, but this has to be avoided not by approaching energy issue alone, because the food issue is equally important and even more important. And just to link the food issue with energy through climate change and what it was said before about the Renaissance Dam or through the melting of the, uh, uh, the glaciers, uh, some scientists uh, argue that they have, some say they don't have link with the flow of Nile. But uh, in my, I believe that it does have. And that means that Nile will have a higher flow for some years because of the melting. And then what? And 10 million inhabitants in the delta of Nile uh, uh, live in, uh, uh, in, in an area that is less than one meter from the surface of the sea. So the vulnerability there is huge. We are not talking then about choices. We are talking about crisis. So we need to, to move regionally, nationally, and globally uh, towards more difficult, complex decisions. And these decisions are taken at global level. But when we come at regional or national level, we see that we escape in different ways. So the first message is that the water scarcity, the food complexity, the ecosystem erosion have to actually ask the energy sector to take its responsibilities. And the responsibility is there when you are about to provide with one or two cents difference from here to there cannot be understood by the society. It has to be taken into account. I'm not against mix, energy mix, definitely, but renewables are also an option for this part of the world. And uh, we should not actually deviate from trying to see the next day and not necessarily use all the traditional paths that we have followed in other parts of the world. And actually, these paths, to a certain extent, are imposed on us, not only by companies, but also by powers. So I think it is absolutely necessary to take a distance from the immediate gains or immediate losses and try to uh, elaborate a strategy that is a no regret strategy. So this is, um, in few words, what I wanted to say. It has to do also with education. Uh, because wh how we are going to do that? The three groups of uh, tools are, of course, regulation. It was said, regulation, uh, incentives, all what is uh, in the hands of the mostly the countries or the administrations. It is science and technology, no doubt, uh, we solve many problems, increase the carrying capacity of the systems through technology. But also, we need to change the culture and behavior. We need education, which has both the components of specialization, 
of doing what is necessary also for the market, also for the society, but also the overall understanding of how human beings should be in the coming years. Already we have people who are already uh, alternatives. And many of them are considered today as marginal, marginalized societies within each society. But they are not necessarily marginalized. There are some of them are uh, choosing a different style, lifestyle, almost provocative, because they don't see that the society is moving towards a, a direction that could solve its problems for the future. So we need all these three, uh, three tools. I repeat, uh, regulation, science and technology, and, and education and awareness raising in order to have a wise combination. And this is something difficult. And we have to, first of all, we have to train ourselves to do that. And this is extremely difficult, but absolutely necessary. It's a matter of survival. So you will have to leave us now for the airport. Is there, there, one, if there, is there one pressing question? Two minutes? Three minutes. Two minutes. We have two minutes. Someone wants to jump in? No? Um. I apologize for, for leaving the panel. Uh, Professor, thank you. Thank you very, I very much. The airport. Thank yes. you so much. Thank, so you. thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor. We, we appreciate it. We will continue with our second panelist, and I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Farid. Thank you. Probably most of you or everyone already knows. Uh, you're the Director General of Hydraulic and Electrical Resources of Lebanon, uh, appointed Chairman of the National Authority of the Litani River. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> I need to be very close to Okay. Um, so I'll repeat. I was saying that I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Fadi Komer, whom most of you probably, if not everyone, already knows. He's the Director General of Hydraulic and Electric, uh, Electrical Resources of Lebanon, appointed Chairman of the National Authority of the Litani River, President of Medurable. You can see that also uh, among the organizers of this uh, event. And the Honorary President of Mediterranean a Network of Basin Organizations and much more, Thank but you. I leave it to this, and uh, uh, you will address uh, three different topics, water, energy, food nexus, hydro diplomacy, and SDGs, so we'll be looking forward to listening to you. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. I will speak in French. Uh, Permettez-moi tout d'abord de remercier Son Excellence, Monsieur le Président Amin Gemayel, pour son chaleureux accueil à Big Faya, cette ville qui a donné au Liban des politiciens, des hommes d'État hors pair et euh, qui ont marqué euh, par leur présence depuis l'indépendance jusqu'à maintenant la souveraineté et aussi l'unité du Liban. Je voudrais aussi saluer la présence euh, d'un grand technocrate qui est avec nous, avec qui j'ai travaillé 20 ans. C'est le président Fouad Sanyoura. J'ai travaillé avec lui quand j'étais euh, président de l'Office national du Litanie et puis aussi en tant que directeur général des ressources hydrauliques du Liban. Euh, je voudrais remercier M. Robert Sursoc de nous avoir aussi invité à cette conférence et aussi pour l'opportunité pour que Mais Durable soit aussi un des organisateurs de, de cette conférence. Je, je vais commencer par euh, ma présentation donc, qui s'articule autour de trois thèmes essentiels et je serai très rapide, je couvrirai ces trois thèmes en cinq à sept minutes. Le premier thème, c'est l'avenir de la planète. J'enchaîne avec ce que le professeur Michael Skoulos a présenté. Cet avenir de la planète qui est, qui est lié directement au nexus de l'eau, de l'énergie et euh, aussi de l'alimentation. Et j'ajouterai l'écosystème pour faire plaisir aussi à, à mon grand frère et, et camarade euh, Michael. Cet avenir, en fait, euh, de la planète est étroitement lié donc, aux changements globaux ces changements globaux qui vont amplifier la demande en eau et la demande en énergie, la demande en, euh, en alimentation des citoyens de la planète. Et le dérèglement de ce nexus pourrait conduire 
à Dieu ne plaise, à l'extinction de la civilisation. Nous avons connu jadis une extinction de la civilisation, c'est la civilisation des Mayas qui s'est éteinte il y a des milliers d'années, et actuellement nous avons deux exemples probants devant nous. Le premier exemple, c'est la mer d'Aral. La mer d'Aral, qui fut durant les années 60, qui avait comme superficie de 70 000 kilomètres carrés, actuellement elle en fait uniquement 8 000 kilomètres carrés, du fait du dérèglement et de la faillite du Nexus. Pourquoi Parce que durant les années 60, euh, le régime communiste euh, de, euh, de l'URSSS a voulu donc détourner l'amour d'Aria et le cirque d'Aria pour lancer des projets de grande envergure d'irrigation du coton. Donc l'irrigation est un élément majeur dans ce que j'appelle la mauvaise gestion de l'eau, surtout que si l'irrigation repose sur une irrigation surfacique et ne prend pas en compte le goutte-à-goutte -goutte ou bien l'aspersion. Certes, ces nouvelles techniques nécessitent une formation, une éducation, mais nécessitent aussi qu'on puisse prévoir pour les agriculteurs des microcrédits afin que ces agriculteurs puissent changer leur mode technologique d'irrigation. Deuxièmement, concernant le second exemple le plus probant, c'est aussi la mer morte. Cette mer morte qui faisait, il y a une trentaine d'années, 800 km, qui en est actuellement jusqu'à 600 km. Et je voudrais saluer l'initiative de Madame Chermine Dejani, qui est présente avec nous aujourd'hui, de Jordanie, qui a lancé une initiative pour sauver la mer morte en Jordanie. Et d'ici, je crois... L'automne 2020, il y aura une grande assemblée générale avec une charte qui sera présentée aux Nations Unies afin de préserver la mer morte. Troisième point concernant la, cette idée-là, c'est que dans euh, les pays arabes, 60% de l'eau renouvelable provient des pays qui ne sont pas, des pays qui ne sont pas directement liés à la Ligue arabe. Donc, d'où aussi les hydropuissances qui sont certes présentes au Moyen-Orient, telles que la Turquie, telles que l'Éthiopie, telles que aussi Israël, et qui pratiquent une gestion unilatérale de l'eau transfrontalière. C'est un sujet que le président Seigneur a aussi évoqué, donc euh, euh, maintenant, et ça pourrait conduire, ça pourrait conduire donc. Euh, imminemment à des conflits entre les pays riverains. Donc ces pays-là, comme l'Éthiopie qui lance ce barrage, le barrage de la Renaissance, pour stocker 80% du débit du Nil, 60 milliards de mètres cubes d'eau, pour produire 7000 mégawatts d'électricité. Moi, en tant qu'ingénieur, j'ai beaucoup fait de barrages, je pourrais vous dire que on peut produire les 7000 mégawatts d'électricité sans avoir recours à un stockage de 60 milliards de mètres cubes d'eau. On aurait pu faire un barrage de 2 milliards et mettre des turbines au fil de l'eau et produire ces 7000 mégawatts dont l'Éthiopie en a besoin, ainsi que les États d'Afrique qui se situent à l'amont en ont besoin. Donc ce projet est un projet politique, ce n'est pas un projet d'ingénieur. Le dernier point que je voudrais soulever, c'est l'hydrodiplomatie. L'hydrodiplomatie, donc, c'est un concept que... J'ai lancé il y a une vingtaine d'années ce concept à vocation d'asseoir la paix hydrique entre les pays riverains. La paix hydrique entre les pays riverains est une chose essentielle, surtout qu'avec le changement climatique, nous aurons 30% en moins d'eau et de précipitations, donc nous aurons, on va peiner à produire une alimentation régulière pour les Méditerranéens et pour les pays arabes, sachant que le seuil que la FAO adressé pour les pays, c'est 1000 mètres cubes par habitant et par an, et 80% des pays arabes sont en dessous de ce seuil, 500 mètres cubes par an et par habitant. C'est la raison pour laquelle, et je termine avec le dernier point, le dessalement, c'est la technologie qui est utilisée dans les pays du Golfe, ce n'est pas la solution car le dessalement est énergivore, la solution pourrait être l'utilisation des énergies renouvelables en période entre le jour et, et la nuit, et après 
changer d'utilisation pour passer à l'utilisation donc de la production électrique thermique ou bien nucléaire. Mais il faut certes être prêt pour que les pays arabes puissent recevoir l'énergie nucléaire car ça demande une éducation, ça demande une préparation et si on ne change pas nos habitudes, on arrête le gaspillage, on arrête l'irrigation et l'agriculture forcée dans les pays du Golfe pour produire un kilo de tomates qui coûte au gouvernement des pays arabes 20 dollars pour les produire pour après les vendre à 10 cents. Donc il faut arrêter le gaspillage de l'agriculture et travailler aussi sur les rendements des réseaux qui fuient généralement dans les pays arabes à plus de 50%. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Uh, and uh, the last point that you mentioned, uh, I think it's important to raise uh, the question of management that has already come up several times. So there has to be better management of water, more efficient distribution and more efficient irrigation systems and the change of crops that are less water intensive. So not only tomatoes and watermelons, but uh, yes, more, uh, more efficient crops. So uh, we will have still time to... Uh, get deeper into the discussion, so we move on to the next oh. panelist. Um, and uh, uh, the next panelist, I invite uh, Madame uh, Rada, uh, Radia um, Sidawi. No, pardon. You are um, so many notes. <laughs> Well, you've already been introduced. Oh, yeah, just say about so that. I'll just say you're chief of the energy section in the sustainable development and uh, policy division of uh, uh, ESQUA. And uh, you will talk to us also about water and energy food nexus, but with another, um, another perspective, more of the oil and gas uh, perspective, and also maybe start switching more to the topic of uh, renewable energies. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm the only one from the energy background in this panel. Je vais pas parler en français. I will just uh, follow up in English. Uh, Mr. Fadi Khmer indicated a certain point. I just will compliment on what he said uh, from the energy perspective. First, I want to say that already the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development provided the integrated approach. So when you talk about water in the Middle East and energy, it's the same because you need to produce energy for water and water for energy. And that's why the pricing of water and energy are extremely interlinked, especially if we talk about the GCC. The second point that's within the GCC as part of the Middle East, we have too much water and little water. Why too much water? Because when we produce one barrel of oil, we have 10 to 9 barrels of, uh, of water that we come with it. And the processing of this water and uh, water processing in terms of treatment and things like that, uh, wastewater treatment as well, this is not uh, properly taken into consideration. And the technologies as well, they are not as much developed. And I think within the region, we need to to develop our own, I would say, methodology on doing this. So basically, uh, there are a lot of good experiences done in this sense in Oman, for example, but uh, I would appreciate that there is a regional collaboration between the countries to share these experiences. Within also the oil and gas sector, the, what people also mention, usually talk about electricity. The oil and gas sector is the most consumed in terms of water, not only as I indicated at the production, but also at the enhanced oil recovery. We inject a lot of water to get oil, and for this, and IOCs and IOCs as well may not have paid for the water which it has much more value if we talk it from a long term perspective and given the, the nature of the region so basically uh, these are the things that we need really carefully to look at it more importantly, the water is the whole value chain in the energy sector, from the exploration to the production of electricity, the downstream sector, petrochemicals, and so on. Maybe this is a familiar language for those who are in the oil and gas sector, but for those who will have to produce oil and gas, they need to very carefully to look at the technologies that maximize, or let's say, manage the natural resources from water and energy both. And the technologies exist already, there are certain good practices, but we need to carefully look at the good solutions. And it has obviously the investment to be done. The, the third point uh, of this that Mr. Um, Fadi Khmer talked about the, 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 the change of in terms of agriculture things, uh, sector and so on. 
There is one critical element in the region that it's extremely energy intensive, water intensive. How? Even in the agricultural sector, why it's very intensive in terms of energy use? Because of the technologies used. Unfortunately, we're still far away than using the latest technology in terms of the agriculture. So whether we are in GCC producing tomato that's very costly, the same if you go to Jordan, and unfortunately, the water is subsidized, going to sell it in Qatar at a cheaper price. So all of this needs to be also considered from a technology perspective to enhance the efficiency of the energy use. Uh, and basically, as I indicated this morning, we do have no sustainable production and consumption within the region, not only for energy but also for water, as long as it's subsidized. So if we need to carefully look at to also build the capacity of government institutions and look at which kind of institutions we need to have. Do we need to have water ministry and energy ministry together? Does it mean that they collaborate? Does it mean that when they do their policies, they really collaborate together? We don't know. I mean, it's not a one business model. We need to look at what's the real business model that doesn't fit for all, but needs to be within the context. Now it comes to be given that I talk about energy and that we highlighted and the professor said about renewable energy. First, let's talk about the efficiency in terms of water management and then in terms of pricing and in terms of energy use and the technology. Then we move, and this is you will save 70% what you are using today. And then renewable energy has a tremendous potential, more than in the oil and gas sector, than electricity generation. And this is where basically I don't see too much people talking about that. Actually, in the oil and gas sector, there are a lot of good experiences done in the United Arab Emirates, also in Oman, also in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, for example, where you look at basically Basically, uh, even when you talk about enhanced oil recovery, you do first desalination using uh, advanced technology in terms of, uh, I would say, desalination using renewable energy, and more importantly, generation electricity. And then you come up that you don't need as much, you don't need to inject water, use other solutions. And for this, you would have used the renewable energy across the different value chain of the oil and gas sector. And I would say you would save 70% of the costs. Specifically, that the cost of renewable energy is going extremely down within the region due to the tremendous potential that we have in solar, provided that we use the right technologies that fits to the environment because the dust in the GCC is not, we have wind here, and for example, in, in Beirut and uh, Lebanon, and we do have other much more potential for small-scale uh, projects. Uh, the other elements I would say to, to complete the, the, the discussion is to say that uh, when we worked on the water energy nexus and basically what we prefer at the UN ESCO, we developed framework where we say the integrated approach where you have human rights, respect of human rights, everybody has the right to have access to water and energy, and more importantly, the climate change. All of this you integrated in a way that policymakers, when we are trying to redesign our policies, we need to design policies that engage everybody and speak the same dialogue. At the policy level, we identify that people don't speak the same language. So let them first start speaking the same language, understand each other, and basically when you revise your policies and reform your prices, you need to make it in a way that addresses the integrated approach and at the end will lead to a much more sustainable future. So we do not only need more cooperation in the region, but within each country between the different sectors. So, yes, thank you very much, uh, Radia. Um, now we move quickly to our um, fourth speaker, uh, Dr. Ahmad Kandil from uh, Egypt. Just wait until the music is off. Okay, we'll just leave it as ambient music. Uh, so, Dr. Ahmed Kandil, Director of Energy Studies Program at the Alham, uh, Al-Haram Center for Political Strategic Studies in Cairo. You're an expert on energy relations so within the Arab region and advise several uh, governmental organizations. Um, so you will talk about major challenges uh, for water security and uh, will address it more from a public policy perspective, also address the regional cooperation uh, that we need and uh, have a look on tensions that could escalate even further than they already are in the future. Thank you very much, Daniela. Allow me again to thank uh, uh, President uh, Amin Jmail and Betel Mustakbal to host us today uh, and allow me to speak in Arabic. Uh, the 
لشعوب هذه المنطقة من السهل جدا اشتعال المنطقة للسيطرة على الموارد المائية المحدودة جدا المتاحة الحقيقة أنا مش هقدر أضيف كتير على قاله البروفيسور فادي والبروفيسور مايكل من ناحية الأرقام والإحصائيات كلنا عارفين حجم المأساة اللي بنعيشها في مسألة المياه وكلنا عارفين الحلول وكلنا عارفين الـ 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 how to get there يعني أو how to deal أو handle this serious crisis النقطة اللي عايز أركز عليها حضراتكم المستقبل يعني هناك تطور بالغ الأهمية ربما يساعد في حل مسألة يعني التعامل مع مشكلة المية باستخدام الطاقة المتجددة وهو دخول اتفاقية باريس للتغير المناخي حيز النفاذ من العام القادم هذه الاتفاقية بتنص على أن الدول المتقدمة تساعد الدول النامية بحوالي 100 مليار دولار سنويا لمساعدتها على التكيف والتخفيف من أثار التغير المناخي المشاكل الأساسية اللي بتواجه الدول العربية في مواجهة نقطة المياه هي التمويل والتكنولوجيز والإرادة السياسية ووجود رؤية لو قدرنا نستفيد من هذه العناصر هنقدر نتعامل مع هذه المشكلة بفعالية حاليا أيضا هناك غياب للحوار الإقليمي حوالين التعامل مع مشكلة المياه هناك رؤى إسرائيلية وتركية لمستقبل موضوع المياه في المنطقة يمكن حضراتكم كلكم تعرفوا رؤية شيمون بريز للشرق الأوسط الجديد اللي طرحها في 1991 إن المعادلة الأساسية للترتيب الأوضاع في المنطقة هي النفط السعودي العقول الإسرائيلية المياه التركية والأيد العاملة المصرية بالتالي الرؤية دي محتاج ان احنا نناقشها اذا كنا فعلا يعني جادين في ترتيب اوضاع وخلق شرق اوسط جديد هل هذا يحقق مصالح الامن القومي العربي ولا لا هل هتتوفر لها موارد لتحقيقها على ارض الواقع المياه مسألة حياة وموت واحنا حسينا في ده بشدة في مصر في السنوات الاخيرة عندما بدأت سيوبيا أن هي تفكر في إنشاء سد النهضة وأعتقد الرئيس السادات قبل كده يعني كان له مقولة شهيرة بيقول أن لو مصر ذهبت للحرب مرة أخرى فسوف تذهب إليها بسبب المياه المياه مسألة حياة أو موت في مصر 104 مليون مواطن أو مصري يعيشون على هذه الأرض موارد مائية يعني إحنا حد الكفاف المائي أو حد الفقر المائي اللي هو الألف متر مكعب إحنا تقريبا أقل من خمسمائة متر مكعب بالتالي دي مسألة ما يعني لا جد إحنا على يمكن في دول تانية لا تستشعر هذه المعضلة بقوة لكن ده أحد المهددات الأساسية للأمن القومي المصري طبعا التفاوض مع أسيوبيا بتعترضوا يعني عوائق كثيرة هم لديهم حلم تحقيق تنمية كبرى هناك بإقامة هذا السد وتوليد كهرباء وبيعها وما إلى ذلك من حقهم يقوموا بذلك لكن في نفس الوقت الحوار مطلوب لعدم تأثر المصريين بذلك ودي يمكن الدكتور فادي أكد على هذه النقطة إن في مبالغة إثيوبية في الـ 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 كيفية تنفيذهم لفكرة هذا السد وبالتالي يعني الحوار مطلوب بشدة مع دول الجوار للتفاهم حول هذه المسألة الحساسة في حاجة مهمة أيضا جدا وهي استفادة من تجارب النجحة في المنطقة فيما يتعلق بالتعامل مع ندرة المياه الأردن لديها تجربة هائلة في استفادة من القطاع الخاص في دخول هذا القطاع حتى الآن هناك احتقار من جانب الدولة للمؤسسات أو لصناعة المياه في المنطقة عدم يعني تخلي الحكومة عن هذه القطاع بشكل كبير سوف يمثل عقبة أمام تطوير أو التعامل الفعال مع هذه دعم المياه أيضا مشكلة كبيرة وتحدى أيضا يواجه كثير من الدول العربية 
طبعا الدعم بيؤدي للاسراف في الاستهلاك وممارسات غير بيئيه متعدده ترشيد هذا الدعم واعطائه لمستحقي و السير في تحرير هذا القطاع ربما ايضا يساهم في المستقبل طبعا في افكار كثيره اشار ليها ايضا البروفيسور فادي لكن اهم بقى من وجهه نظر الكسرين رفع الوعي لدى الناس بمساله ترشيد المياه وعدم الاسراف في استهلاك ده يعني ده هيوفر استثمارات كبيره جدا يعني في البدايه يعني لانشاء محطات جديده او ايجاد تكنولوجيات جديده يعني ضخ استثمارات في زياده الانتاج تقليل الاستهلاك دوت اعتقد ده وسيله سريعه ووسيله فعاله ووسيله يعني بس هي الوعي ومد الايد للناس العاديين في الشارع ان هم يفهموا يعني ايه استهلاك يعني في ممارسات جديده كتيره يمكن ترشيدها لدى الناس الإعلام الحقيقة بيلعب دور غير إيجابي إطلاقا في توعية الناس حتى الآن لا توجد يعني إعلام مائي أو مناسب لطبيعة هذه المشكلة وبالتالي رغم أن هي من أخطر المشاكل اللي بتواجهنا في المنطقة إلا أن هي مسكوت عنها وفي تجاهل لها. الحقيقه انا مش عايز اطول اكتر من كده وشكرا جزيلا. We move now to our fifth panelist to Dr. Jean-Pierre Sursoc. He is a former senior technical executive at Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI. He led the um, expansion strategy in nuclear power of EPRI in, uh, in Europe, in Latin America, in the Middle East. Uh, and also coordination with uh, the research and development coordination with uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency of the United Nations and the Nuclear Energy Agency of the OECD. So you will talk to us about uh, nuclear power, which by some is considered uh, as, a, as a cleaner uh, power or energy source, as we don't have that much greenhouse gas emissions. Maybe there are other issues, but uh, at least in terms of emissions. Uh, it's cleaner. So, uh, can you explain to us a bit on um, so how, uh, on a worldwide view and a global view, and then a regional view, uh, how many uh, in how many countries are we operating? Uh, what are the advantages of nuclear power? Uh, what are the disadvantages or the challenges? And uh, what is the situation right now in in the region? Which uh, uh, recommendations could you give, and which con uh, concerns can you share with us? Well, thank you, Daniela. And let me take a moment just to thank um, His Excellency President Amin Jemayel and the Maison de Future for inviting me. It's a real honor for me to be with you today and with the rest of the panel. Um, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm a nuclear, I work in the nuclear energy field. And uh, uh, whenever I mention that to anybody who meets me for the first time, I look at their eyes and I see all of a sudden a mush an, an atomic mushroom in their eyes or, or some, uh, some strange, uh, scary face. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm here to basically give you, I know nuclear power is a very controversial uh, technology for, for, uh, for a lot of people. So I'm here to give you a little, uh, some facts, um, uh, hopefully objective facts about uh, the value of nuclear power and the role it can play in a region like the Middle East where uh, power is, uh, is becoming increasingly of value and show you that there is uh, an integrated approach to nuclear power. As I would like to thank Mr. Komerf, by the way, for laying the ground for the need for nuclear energy uh, and introducing it in this region because you will see that uh, there is a complementarity between nuclear power and uh, and renewable energies. Um, so uh, you asked me about a few questions about uh, um, putting that in context. There are about 450 plants uh, operating around the world today, uh, nuclear plants. Um, so roughly 10% of the, of the power uh, that is... Uh, um, so... Uh, I will show you just a single slide, which uh, is it the, at the heart of everything you need to understand to apprehend the value of nuclear power. 
uh, on the left, I don't know if you can see it well, you have uh, a hand holding three pellets of uranium oxide. Each one of these pellets is about the size of your fingertip. Uh, it weighs about seven grams. And each one of these pellets uh, contains the, en the amount of energy equivalent of 850 kilograms of coal. Each one of these pellets contains the energy included in about 150 gallons of oil, about four, four barrels, and about 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. So within this single picture, you can see both the, the power and promise of nuclear power as well as potential drawbacks that it can hold, and which we can talk about uh, in the minutes to come. But uh, this gives you an idea of the picture. Each one of the plants that I talked about, 450 plants that I talked about, provides power to about roughly a million people. Um, so uh, it's a quite a concentrated form of energy, and it could be a valuable uh, tool in a, in a grid uh, to provide base load power. Uh, we, see, we can talk about that in more detail in a minute. Uh, as far as the Middle East is concerned, and maybe I can show you another interesting slide here. Um, there, is a number of, there are a number of projects. Uh, on, on the right-hand side, you can see a, um, a map of the region. Um, and on the left, a table. Uh, uh, can you read the table from the back end? Is that something you can... Okay. Um, basically, it shows you the projects that have started or are being considered in our area. Um, the most advanced one is the one in the United Arab Emirates, uh, which is building four nuclear plants, as we speak, um, which will provide about 20, 25 percent of their needs. Uh, uh, the first plant will start operating hopefully in a few months, uh, and, the, and the fourth one will operate in two or three years from now. Um, then uh, Egypt is the next one in line. To, uh, they have started construction of one plant, and they will follow up with another three plants. Uh, a number of other countries have, are considering um, um, building. Uh, Turkey is building one. Uh, Saudi Arabia is considering to build 16 plants. So pretty soon we will have 30 to 40 plants in this area. And this is also a, um, a game changer as far as this area is concerned. In the, in, the, in the next 20 years. So what are the advantages uh, and what would be the uh, drawbacks of some of these plants? Uh, the advantages stems from the concentrated value and the reliability that these plants are operating with. A single plant can operate roughly two years without, without interruption, without need for refueling, without need for maintenance. Uh, which gives it a lot of uh, uh, stability. Uh, the, the cost of the fuel is very low. The, uh, uranium is very abundant. Uh, we have reserves, um, uh, uh, assured reserves for over 100 years. Um, and um, it's relatively uh, cheap nowadays to build uh, nuclear fuel. Uh, so it's a very small fraction of the operating cost of a nuclear power plant. And it's very stable because there are uranium mines all over the world. Um, the other uh, major value of nuclear power, as you mentioned, is it's carbon-free. So you don't have to worry about uh, greenhouse gas uh, effects associated with that. Uh, so those are some of the key advantages um, so on the drawback side, a nuclear power uh, requires a lot of money to build. A single one of, any one of these units that you want to build today will cost you about $5, $5 billion. Uh, it also requires to put in place a large infrastructure uh, and, uh, of human resources as well as uh, processes, as well as uh, oversight um, regulatory bodies, and so on and so forth. And it's, uh, it's a very uh, expensive proposition. Uh, and, a, and a third uh, drawback is what do you do with the, with the uh, nuclear waste? 
uh, how do you handle it, how do you store it, um, how do you transport it. So, so these are some of the key issues that we can talk about in more details as if you have questions. Um, there are uh, a lot of experience around the world handling uh, both the advantages and the disadvantages uh, associated with this uh, technology. But I think it has a major role to play, or at least some role to play in this area, as uh, we are looking for a mix between um, non-carbonated sources, uh, whether it's renewable or a nuclear power. I think, you, as you see, some of the countries have identified that need and are, are acting on it. And uh, I, I think I will stop here for now and let you... Um, Thank you very much. Um, for uh, your intervention. Are there already any questions uh, that you would like to share with us? Otherwise, I would have a, a short one directly uh, um, coming back to the topic of nuclear power. So, Jean-Pierre, I know the Turkish scheme is on a seismic fault. And I'm sorry? Well, the Turkish planned yeah. uh, project is on a seismic earthquake-prone area. Yes. Uh, I... I I personally, um, you know, I'm, I'm filled with apprehension at the thought. Are any of the other schemes that similarly f impacted? Uh, um, am oh. I just being alarmist? In the, in, in the Middle East or in general? Yeah, in, the, well, in the Middle East, but in general, yeah. Uh, in the Middle East, no, there aren't, uh, that, to my knowledge at least, that's, n that's not a major issue elsewhere. In, uh, in California, of course, uh, the Diablo Canyon plant, which is a large uh, 4,000 megawatt plant has been built on a San Andreas fault, which is one of the largest fault uh, seismically uh, active. Um, in Japan, there are a number of plants that have been uh, built on that, uh, on, on seismic uh, faults, um, particularly one famous one, which yes. I won't recall here. Um, but um, yes, there, so plants can be built. Um, with, uh, with provision for uh, seismic uh, up to Richter scale uh, 7, 7.3, uh, with, uh, with sustaining, uh, can sustain a, a magnitude of uh, up to 7.3 on the Richter scale. Um, and they are, they are designed to shut down uh, immediately uh, under those circumstances. And in fact, the Fukushima plant, which we were referring to earlier, in fact, had shut down uh, uh, as soon as the earthquake was felt. Uh, what was caused the damage was not the earthquake at Fukushima. It was, it was the tsunami that followed. Thank you. I was wondering now, we have seen that more and more countries in the region uh, engage in non-military use of nuclear power. So I was wondering how far is the step to military use and uh. how likely is it and how would you rate the interest in different countries to engage in? This because if we talk about region security and geopolitics, I think yes. it's also something we should discuss. That's a very good question. Um, nuclear power uses uh, uh, enriched fuel. Um, enriched fuel meaning that there is a proportion of um, uranium-235, uh, about 3 to 5 percent, in, in the fuel. In order to, um, and so in the course of operating the plant, you also create plutonium uh, in, the, in, the, in the core. And in order to, to uh, use this uh, fuel for military uses, you have either to get uh, um, about 95% of uranium-235. That means you need special enrichment uh, um, processes, uh, such as the ones that Iran was accused of having or building secretly. Um, but uh, those cannot be done simply from looking at, from uh, utilizing uh, the fuel of uh, a nuclear power plant. Or you need to extract the plutonium out of, uh, of, the, of the used fuel, and that would require uh, reprocessing, uh, and that requires a, a very heavy, difficult uh, organization and process because plutonium is quite poisonous, and so you cannot approach it and use it with your hands um, or inhale it. And so you need to have 
uh, installations that are quite necessarily obvious from a satellite and so forth. You cannot do that very secretly uh, unless you're, you're really bent on spending billions of dollars doing that. So there is a firewall between the military application and the civil, uh, and civil applications in general. So it's quite, uh, it's quite safe. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Can you tell us a little bit about thorium? About? Thorium. Thorium. Thorium is a, is a, is a very interesting uh, technology which is being uh, revived uh, right now. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the thorium uh, capacity, thorium is a very abundant uh, element uh, in the Earth's crust, um, very close to uranium, uh, but it's a fissile, um, it's, I'm sorry, a fertile material, meaning you cannot, you cannot break uh, uh, the atom and divide it as you break a uranium atom uh, and create energy out of the fission. In order to create energy out of the thorium, you really need to uh, first um, impregnate it with a, an additional neutron and then I'm getting too technical here, but my point is uh, you can transform thorium into uh, something you can use in a nuclear reactor, but in order to do that, you have to have a, a pre-operation, sort of getting it pregnant before you can, you can uh, use it. So that technology was set aside uh, up until now because it was economically not useful or, or valid, but... But it's becoming more interesting now because people are looking at new technologies that will make this uh, use of the thorium uh, in, in molten salt reactors a lot more economically viable. And so within 10 years or 20 years from now, we, we could look forward to having a thorium economy which would then open up a, a new field for, for nuclear where we have an abundance of, uh, of, of fuel uh, at very cheap cost, um, but it will take uh, some technological development uh, which are ongoing right now. I hope I answered your question. Hmm? Yeah, uh, thorium will, will end up with the same, same technology and the same advantages and disadvantages and the same... Tra- same consequences, yes. Yeah, same, because thorium, once it burns in a reactor, uh, transforms into plutonium, and so you'd have to handle the plutonium out of the reactor the same way as you have to do it today. Yes. Also, some questions on the panel. Is it directly related? Then, then we just, uh, as it's directly related, uh, give a little commentary. I have lived in Japan for 11 years. Uh, and uh, the, the, the main reason which pushed me out of Japan was the Fukushima disaster, <laughs> nuclear disaster. Yes. And that put uh, a high psychological barrier. Yes. Against it, because I saw by my eyes how is it how it's dangerous, even in an advanced country like Japan, and even with its high high tech uh, sec- uh, safeguards or something. But do you think that we are here in this region are qualified enough to deal with such huge disaster? I know Egypt has a very ambition nuclear. Uh, many other Arab countries, but I very doubt that we are well uh, equipped and well uh, qualified to deal with such disasters. This is a very fascinating uh, question. Thank you for asking it. Um, and my answer is yes, you are definitely, we are definitely, we are definitely qualified in this area. First of all, we have the engineers, we have the brain power, uh, we have a, a good 
control of the technologies. Uh, for instance, Egypt has been has a had a research reactor since 1960 uh, and and has produced a number of engineers have extremely qualified in this field, and other countries have as well. My point about this is once you start a program like a nuclear power program, you have to be committed to it. And you have to be committed to a nuclear safety culture that is totally uncompromising in terms of you cannot allow anybody to say, "Eh, it's okay, I'll do it this way today. Uh, Or I'll close my eyes on that particular little piece of paper that is on the floor. You cannot, if you walk in, if you ever walked in the nuclear reactor, you think you are walking into uh, 100% completely sanitized, uh, completely clean. You don't see a single piece of dirt anywhere. The, 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 it's a military organization, basically, that you're dealing with inside a nuclear part plant because it, everybody is so rigorous about, uh, about safety. What happened in Japan is, I'm glad you brought this question, because it's a cultural thing. Uh, believe it or not, in a country like Japan, the issue, and they admit it, that's why I'm free to speak about it. The, what happened at Fukushima is that you had people who are, the, the, the safety authorities came from the same schools as the people from Tokyo Electric Power, who's running the plant. And they were buddies. And you didn't have this total independence between the safety authorities who were supposed to oversee the safety of those plants and the people who are running it. They were two, two buddies, too, too, too close to each other, too familiar with each other, going out and drinking together, going out and having parties together, going out and and marrying, intermarrying, or whatever. This is not... You need to keep the barrier. So as you are building, and that's caused complacencies, and they admit it freely, okay? The, the complacency in the sense that where there were changes that were needed to protect Fukushima from a tsunami that were delayed with the... Uh, acceptance of the safety authorities, the, the delayed and delayed year after years, and eventually the tsunami happened without this modification, uh, which would have saved the plan happening. But, but as we start our nuclear program in in this area, I think we should put, and I reckon, I really hope we should put in place leaders of the programs of the safety programs who are going to be intransigent about safety, who are going to be, the, the regulatory bodies are going, who should be intransigent about keeping distance with the operator, maintaining their independence. The leaders, the first set of leaders we are going to put in charge of ensuring safety are going to decide the culture of safety in this region. And they should be picked to be really intransigent in terms of what they want to instill in terms of their culture. Once they do that, the generation to follow will have the same, the same approach. This is what happens in, in the United States, in, in France, in Germany, in Russia, uh, where you have people in charge who have since the beginning been so rigorous that the generation that followed have been imitating them and emulating them. And I think if we can do the same thing in this, country, in this region, we will find the same results. If you may allow... Yes, Ms. <laughs> we, we go back to, uh, to uh, the audience. I would just like to allow Dr. Fadi for a comment. Uh, just one, one comment, if I may allow to continue about Fukushima, yeah. is that uh, the wall broke in Fukushima. It's not the issue of the nuclear, center, uh, nuclear uh, uh, central. It's the wall, uh, the wall who broke, even though the engineer has dimensioned the wall for 20-meter length, but the choices of the 
private company was 12 meter. Exactly. So we all, you always have to listen to engineers. <laughs> number two. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, num number two. The only issue that we have in the Arab world is either the renewable energy, le plan solaire méditerranéen, the Mediterranean solar plan that has been implemented with the Union for the Mediterranean in 2008, and the nuclear, because to abide by the demand management for the 50 years to come for the Arab world concerning desalination, concerning food, concerning demand management for energy, the only issue is nuclear and uh, renewable energy. And uh, last, if I may allow, a recommendation from this panel is to incite the Arab country to create a high commission for water, energy, and food. A high commission because those are three imbricated uh, uh, problems that the future generation are going to face. So let's prepare ourselves from now, the decision maker, to start thinking about the option. I take the option of nuclear, I take the option of the Mediterranean solar plan, I take the other option, or also the interconnection between the Arab country. And these are very important choices, especially for the irrigation, because here are the waste of water, digging well deep in the aquifer, pumping from 2,000 meters below sea level as the Great River in Libya, and taking the water for 5,000 kilometers far from the wells to uh, uh, another part, it's uh, really uh, uh, something incredible. So these are the issues that we need to work on l later on. If I may add a comment, you, you mentioned irrigation as, a, as an essential uh, interconnection inter between the different countries in the Arab world. I would add nuclear to that because it cannot work without cooperation regional cooperation in this area to, to answer some of your concerns, actually, where you have common sharing of data, of lessons learned from one plant to, with another, sharing of training of experts and technicians, sharing of uh, uh, um, you know, whatever... Uh, Waste, waste uh, management, for instance, is a good example where, where you would need a lot of sharing. So uh, sharing of risks, analyses, and risk uh, uh, of all kinds. So there is an absolute need, and it will fail if you don't have a cooperation among uh, older countries who are building a nuclear program in this area. Uh, Radia, would you like to add something before we yeah, go to the audience? Yeah, because I felt that we are in nuclear power the session, and uh, uh, actually I understood that we deal with water management, and the, one of the questions that uh, uh, actually when we did with the water energy nexus in the energy sector, we look at the nuclear power, and we had uh, someone expert presenting on that, and we look at all the, the, the case studies, and I think this is one of the key questions I may ask just to have your opinion in terms of what's the impact of nuclear power in terms of water management and waste management. And more importantly, one of the aspects, at the end of the day, each country has its sovereign right. They decide on the, the portfolio of solutions in terms of uh, poly, uh, energy options, whether nuclear power, renewable energy, and natural gas. However, when we look at the case study of United Arab Emirates, and you talked about human resources and the dedication of the culture, but when you have a turnover of experts working in this uh, nuclear power stations, uh, and I don't think this would be as sustainable in the future unless you have, you give certain, I would say, right to this uh, expert working, for example, in the GCC countries who do have the qualifications as engineers or experts, uh, and uh, obviously at the end the collaboration might be a little bit difficult because we are talking about gas and the risk, but the nuclear power would be a little bit uh, difficult from my perspective. <laughs> Go back to the audience. I see uh, there are yes. some questions. We still yeah, have half an one hour. More question, please. Yeah, there's time for, for questions. Uh, so please. Recently, recently, two decades ago, in order to recycle nuclear waste, France invented a new technology, surgenerator. Where do we stand on that now, nowadays? The technology you're referring to is basically uh, called 
by other words, uh, breeder, breeder technology. It, the intent of that technology is to use um, the plutonium that is generated into the current plants uh, by, the, by the burning of the uranium, which transform in part into plutonium, and which, as we mentioned earlier, is harmful and poisonous and takes a lot of time to decay. And it's really the, the, a, a major component of the nuclear waste. Uh, so to take that plutonium and burn it because it can be used as a, as a, as a fuel itself. Uh, the, the technology is moving forward. It's called the fourth generation. It's being studied uh, in a number of countries, including France and the United States and Japan and Russia. Um, and China is building a, a breeder as well. Uh, so that at least those four countries are pursuing that technology. Um, India is also considering uh, one. So, yes, no, it's not, it's not dead at all. It's, uh, it's moving forward. Um. Uh, je reviens sur la question de l'eau et je m'adresse uh, au docteur uh, Comer, puisqu'elle a parlé en français, je le reprends. <laughs> Nous sommes d'accord tous que l'eau est une source de vie uh, très importante et qu'au Liban, le problème de l'eau devient vraiment euh, alarmant. Nous savons que de multiples sources d'eau potable euh, dans, émergent dans l'eau de mer, dans la mer et sur les rivages libanais. Est-ce qu'il y a des études qui ont été faites sur cette eau qui est dans qui est, ses sources dans la mer. Et ça, ce serait important de euh, profiter de cette eau qui est gaspillée. Voilà. Très bonne question. question. En fait, quand on a abordé la stratégie de l'eau au Liban, on l'a abordée d'une façon intégrée. Euh, L'agir, la gestion intégrée des ressources en eau, euh, qu'on appelle en anglais IWRM, Integrated Water Resource Management. Nous avons pris en considération les eaux non conventionnelles. Et ces résurgences d'eau de mer figurent dans la catégorie des eaux non conventionnelles, comme aussi la réutilisation des eaux usées. Or, pour l'irrigation, je reviens à l'irrigation et je réponds à votre question, il faudrait que d'or et déjà qu'on utilise la réutilisation des eaux usées pour l'irrigation afin de soulager les pays qui ne disposent pas d'eau renouvelable en matière d'eau renouvelable, que cette eau renouvelable puisse être destinée à l'eau potable. Je pense aux pays du Golfe et je pense au dessalement aussi. Donc, pour les résurgences d'eau de mer, nous avons lancé l'étude dans, la, dans le cadre de la stratégie nationale il y a une dizaine d'années. Et euh, en fait, euh, cette stratégie qui est intégrée pourrait être implémentée directement, mais malheureusement, nous n'avons pas encore la volonté politique. On parle toujours de la mauvaise gestion. Ce n'est pas une question de mauvaise gestion. On sait très bien faire. On sait aussi, on peut appeler au secteur privé pour nous aider dans la gestion de l'eau libanaise. Mais il y a la politique et la bonne volonté politique. Les résurgences d'eau de mer s'évaluent au Liban aux alentours de 500 millions de mètres cubes d'eau. Donc c'est une configuration énorme. karstique assez complexe oui. et le karst sont des labyrinthes qui, euh, euh, qui vont dans tous les sens et qui émergent soit dans la mer au niveau du littoral un peu plus loin ou bien sur la terre naturelle. On peut les capter, on a fait des études, on a envoyé des plongeurs et c'est la marine nationale française qui a acheminé le fleuron de euh, euh, la marine, c'est le bateau le beau temps Beaupré. On a scruté toutes les sources d'eau euh, sur le littoral libanais. Nous avons donc répertorié 40 sources d'eau. Et de ces 40, on pourrait utiliser cette eau-là pour la ramener vers le littoral. Mais il y a un phénomène inverse qui se produit à partir du mois de juillet jusqu'au mois de novembre. C'est que l'intrusion d'eau de mer rentre dans ces labyrinthes et ce phénomène inverse pourrait de nouveau augmenter la salinité des aquifères. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous avons mis cette option pour l'année 2050. 
dans la stratégie nationale. Nous avons une eau de source qui se jette dans la Méditerranée et qui s'évalue à 1 milliard 200 millions de mètres cubes d'eau. Et on continue à faire des forages, malheureusement. C'est pour cela que je vous ai dit la volonté politique. On ne peut plus s'amuser à faire des forages, à pomper dans cette réserve stratégique qui est destinée à être utilisée durant les périodes d'étiage, car on va passer par des périodes d'étiage. Rappelez-vous 2013, ce qui s'est passé au Liban. 2013, la moyenne des précipitations n'a pas euh, euh, dépassé les 300 mm. Donc, la réserve stratégique dans tous les pays du monde, c'est toujours les aquifères. Pourquoi alors la France a lancé la grande hydraulique durant les années 30, 40 et les années 60 En France, il y a 40 barrages, 400 barrages en France pour produire de l'énergie propre, pour alimenter les villes françaises. Mais il faudrait aussi qu'avec les barrages, qu'on puisse travailler sur... Euh, euh, l'efficacité des réseaux. Et l'efficacité des réseaux dans les pays arabes, malheureusement, les réseaux fuient jusqu'à 50%. Et les gouvernements ne savent pas faire. C'est pour cela qu'il faut faire appel au secteur privé. Il y a des gens qui pourraient nous aider. Et nous avons eu une expérience au Liban. C'est la ville de Tripoli, en 1996. Et c'est là où nous avons eu au Liban une ville qui est alimentée 24 heures sur 24 avec l'eau potable et avec des compteurs. Donc, on sait faire, et ce qui nous manque, comme je vous ai dit, c'est la volonté, malheureusement. Monsieur, monsieur maire, excusez-moi, le secteur public a pris, le secteur privé avait pris une grande initiative il y a quatre ans, que vous connaissez, qui s'appelle Blue Gold. Et vous êtes en train de dire maintenant que le gouvernement est en train d'encourager le secteur public. Pourquoi le secteur privé Pourquoi est-ce que le projet, un projet Blue Gold a-t-il été rangé dans le tiroir du gouvernement mon cher oui, qui, Farid, promettait, bon, qui promettait un milliard question. de mètres cubes d'eau chaque année renouvelable. Une très bonne question. Mon cher Farid, le premier projet que nous avons lancé au Liban pour serrer la main au secteur privé, c'était en 2003. En 2003, euh, on a proposé au Conseil des ministres des projets de BOT et de DBOT. Et je me rappelle très bien que le gouvernement a constitué une équipe formé de Shikri Sadr, de Fadi Emer, de Joël Tebet, d'Albert Sarhan, Mahofzan del al -Ab, et on a proposé un projet extraordinaire pour gérer les bassins d'eau du Liban sous forme de BOT et de BOT. Nous, sommes, nous étions les pionniers à faire ça au Liban. Mais jusqu'à présent, jusqu'à ce jour, et je me rappelle très bien, le président Seigneurin nous a convoqués, je crois que c'était en 2008, en 2006, je ne sais pas, je ne me rappelle plus. Il nous a convoqués pour étudier ce projet-là euh, en Conseil euh, des ministres. Et après, ce projet donc a été légué au calendrier grec, malheureusement. C'est pour cela que, sans le secteur privé, surtout dans la gestion de l'eau, surtout dans la gestion de l'eau, et surtout dans un pays qui est miné par la corruption, qui est miné par la corruption, sans les secteurs privés et sans les autorités régulatrices, on ne pourra jamais assurer de bonnes infrastructures, que ce soit dans les transports, que ce soit dans l'eau, que ce soit dans tous les services du Liban. Or, le Blue Gold, quand vous êtes venu pour qu'on puisse lancer le Blue Gold ensemble, l'idée, c'était que, en fait, les citoyens commencent à revendiquer l'appui du secteur privé pour la gestion de l'eau. Et c'est pour cela que nous avons lancé le Blue Gold ensemble. Et malheureusement, on ne fait que perdre des opportunités. Oui, mais c'est dommage, parce qu'à l'époque, on avait eu 150 000 votes de citoyens pour le projet. 150 000 votes ont été jetés à la mer. Et Parfait. ce qu'on demandait, c'était le Conseil national de l'eau. Donc, une, un organisme mixte, pas seulement privé, un organisme privé public. Une Paris, chose on, juste. A, on a initié le Code de l'eau en 2003, tu es au courant. Il a été adopté par le Parlement en 2018. Donc, ça a pris plus de 12 ans pour adopter le Code de l'eau. Donc, oui, mais il faudrait qu'on se mette au travail. Il faudrait qu'on se mette au travail et qu'on puisse euh, qu'on puisse relancer la machine afin que le Liban redevienne comme on l'appelait. Euh, mais bien sûr. Mais, 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 mais je suis convaincu. Je suis convaincu tout ce que tu dis. I think we have to continue maybe with some other questions. But thank you very much for the debate. 
Uh, and I have seen two more questions and then also uh, Rana. So I would like to ask David, is he still there? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm still there. I'm sorry, I'm not going to speak French because I just sound angry in French. Oh, don't worry. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's always bad luck for water people to be on a panel with a nuclear person because everyone wants to talk about nuclear. Um, and I want us to talk about something really boring. Uh, it, it seems that everyone wants to gravitate to the cool, sexy bit, um, technology or, or whatever it may be, when in the end we use so much water because we price it wrong. And what is it that stops, whether it's explicit pricing or implicit pricing, what is it that stops Middle East countries from directing water resources to where they have the highest value? Because even in Saudi Arabia, if you, if you directed water to where it had the highest value and away from some of the agriculture where it's not really needed, you wouldn't need half the desalination, you wouldn't need half the energy, you wouldn't have half the environmental footprint. So is, is there something endemic to the region that stops that discussion from being had? So, in euh, your introduction, you talked about desalination, that it wasn't the right solution, but you talked about it in the context of agriculture. Mais je voulais demander, si vous prenez un pays comme l'Égypte, qui maintenant va se diriger du côté de dessalinisation aussi de l'eau, de mer, pour la consommation domicile, pas pour, euh, pour l'agriculture, euh, est-ce que c'est la même chose ou vous êtes en général contre euh, l'utilisation de, de l'eau de mer euh, et de la dessalinisation Je ne suis pas contre, je n'ai pas dit ça, j'ai dit qu'on l'a programmé pour après, on commence par utiliser l'eau gravitaire qui ne nécessite pas de pompage parce que, euh, comme je vous ai dit quand, quand on a parlé en fait, euh, de l'énergie liée à l'eau, c'est que l'eau est très énergivore aussi. Donc quand il s'agit de pompage, si on pompe dans la nappe phréatique de 600 mètres et même en dessous de 600 mètres, ça veut dire que je consomme pour chaque mètre cube pompé 1,7 kWh. Ça veut dire que ça coûte tant d'argent. C'est pour cela qu'il va falloir travailler sur le gravitaire tout d'abord. Quand on consomme le gravitaire, on pense aux autres techniques. C'est ça. Il va, aller, il va falloir aller doucement dans le processus et c'est le travail d'ingénieur qui doit présenter au pouvoir public. La décision, c'est au gouvernement et c'est là où les politiciens font les choix. Ce n'est pas les technocrates qui font les choix. Il y a quelques observations que je voudrais faire. Et l'une d'entre elles est basiquement combien il est nécessaire d'investir dans l'éducation. Because education, education, and I mean not education, the, the academic one, but education regarding these matters pertaining to water. And water, whether, whether it is actually in really conserving it as a, as a very limited and scarce resource on the one hand, and how to use it properly, particularly that about probably 80% of the water that we use are, are used in the agricultural sector and where still we are using the traditional methods of irrigation rather than the, yes, rather than the, uh, the, the modern ways of, of irrigation. And secondly, regarding pricing of water, pricing of water. Uh, Fadi talked about, uh, about uh, the program that was started uh, yani in, the, uh, in, 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 in the first decade of this century, uh, in the second part of it, uh, in which we were talking about uh, lakes in several places in the country. And that was really very important in order to re-enrich the, uh, the, the artesian water and improve the level of the, of the water table. At that time, we had... We had an accident at that time that really coincided with the, with the problem of the bird's flu. And in many, in many places, we had, to, we had to really evacuate all these hills that, I mean, there are not, not many, but I mean, that was a program that was started, which led later on, we had to really get rid of them because of our fear of having the bird's flu at that time. Uh, that was a craze at this. 
So what I really might mean by this, actually, is the most important thing of, of investing in, in, in proper education. Because these matters is a very uh, an important platform for politicians to continue corrupting the minds of the people and trying to please them in matters that may be helpful for them in the immediate time, but it is definitely very destructive for their future. So this, these are really matters that uh, need to be addressed differently than the way it's being addressed up till now. Thank you all for a really very interesting uh, con conversation and a lot of very interesting data. Um, I had a question going back to energy and natural gas um, to uh, Dr. Serso. Um, th there is a lot of decommissioning of nuclear power plants in Europe. Um, and if that happens, uh, because some have been delayed, do you see gas as being the, the potential... Um, like taking over uh, the supply for, uh, for power. Um, that was my, my first question. My second question was around, uh, and that's uh, an open question, but mostly maybe for Dr. Ahmed. Uh, you, you talked about the Blue Gold Project, uh, and that's a private-led uh, initiative. Uh, or you, the private sector would play a role. How, do, how was, I mean, what were... What were you thinking in terms of pricing of, of, of water or um, uh, enticing the private sector to join when water is kind of a public good and, and who, will, who would pay for, for that? That was my second uh, question. So we have two minutes left to answer? <laughs> or after the answer, we have two minutes? Okay, so please. Uh, quick question. The question was about uh, the commissioning of nuclear power plant, which are essentially being stopped for economical reasons because they cannot compete with uh, gas, uh, with, nat with, uh, uh, with natural gas, basically, uh, combined cycle uh, turbines. Um, yeah, yes, uh, that's true in Europe. It's also true very much so in, more so in the United States, I would say. We are talking about here about older nuclear power plants that in order to compete would have to be completely refurbished. It would cost a lot of money to bring them up to, to, to the level that they would need to be. Um, and so, rightly, they are moved away. Uh, what we are talking about here in this region is building new facilities with modern technologies and updated uh, uh, innovative uh, technologies. I think those are more able to compete with and, and, and carbon-free technologies. And those should be able to compete uh, with, uh, with their counterparts in the natural gas. Rem remember, uh, nuclear will never rise to the level of uh, natural gas in terms of uh, abundance and, and so it will always be the little, the little brother uh, of uh, of, of Car car carbonated uh, energy. And, uh, you know, uh, so as lo there is a role to play, even though it's not the major role. And believe me, I know everything about being a little brother uh, in, this, in this organization. <laughs> and take another question One. because we're done. For whether it is linked to the blue gold or not, privatization is a very complicated or simple issue. It will be a simple issue if you have a very powerful institution. It will be a highly complicated issue if you have weak institutions, these institutions fragile, as we have, unfortunately, in Lebanon. Privatization should be linked directly to regulatory authority. If it is not linked to regulatory authority, we will go directly to monopoly. This is why the issue is how we need to strengthen the institution of the government to train also the uh, clerk of the government in order to accept privatization and to manage privatization. So even if we have the blue gold, even if we have the BOT, DBOT law project that we have been supported by President Senora for that, and we have weak and fragile institution, it will not be a success. This 
when, when you call for the private sector, uh, 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 the people think that directly the price will be uh, directly raised. It's not the issue. The private sector in France, the price go down uh, uh, because they know how to do it. Uh, first, ils virent la moitié des, des fonctionnaires qui sont improductifs et uh, ils forment les autres, l'autre moitié. Donc, uh, they have the know-how how to do this privatization and they augment the coverage of uh, uh, la, la desserte en eau potable. Ils l'augmentent aussi. Donc, they have the know-how how to deal with that. But we, you need to have strong institutions and we know that in France, There, there is a very strong institution, not as we have here, unfortunately, in Lebanon. But we are aiming, we should not uh, uh, be desperate, we are aiming to let the Lebanese institution be strong with the young generation that we have, because they are all eager, Lebanon, to see Lebanon to be, again, as it was the Swiss of the Middle East. Very important. Yeah, I just want to address David's question because it's extremely relevant, uh, specifically in the Middle East, and given he was in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, so he knows perfectly what we mean by about water and uh, how the, uh, the, the natural resource management from water and energy perspective. Actually, to be positive, there are a lot of things that, that is ongoing in the, in the Kingdom and elsewhere in the Middle East, uh, and basically uh, talking about the agriculture, already the food security as a concept changed a lot, whether in the Kingdom that they used to uh, basically have uh, much more, I would say, self-sufficiency, and now we change completely to uh, the same one we say, uh, book reserves, they are booking elsewhere to develop and have the food coming to, to, to the country. Uh, and more importantly, yes, the technology is, uh, is there, but already the uh, agricultural sector advanced too much, but still a lot of things to be done. So in terms of water management, one of the things in the oil and gas sector, what they are doing, some of the solutions that are already implemented uh, currently in some of the business models that we've seen in the United Arab Emirates, in Oman, for example, rather, rather than to, to do enhanced oil recovery with the water injection they are doing in natural gas, and now they are moving carbon capture storage and utilization. We'll see it has also its certain negative impact. But uh, what they also achieved so far is also to work on two aspects. The energy pricing even exceeded 30, 300% in certain cases, uh, but mostly uh, for the final consumer, but also for the industries. In the Arab Emirates, they managed to have a competitive market for all the, the utility uh, uh, companies. They still just have one who is not able to, to compete in the marketplace. So already for the electricity, it's, 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 it's there. I think they will achieve uh, within the coming, let's say, five to ten years, we will have much more rational price in terms of electricity. City. Now it comes to, to the water, then the only problem that is missing here in the oil and gas sector, it's already priced, but we need to move away from, uh, I would say, using water for the injection, things like that. We need to, and it, it's already uh, a lot of experiences that try to, to, to manage uh, the resources in this way. However, in terms of the final consumer, it's still a social benefits, and including in Lebanon, for example. Uh, and, and this is where the, I would say, the energy conservation, it's also water conservation, a lot of awareness that be done uh, at the consumer level, and uh, I would say uh, independently of the sector where you work, if you want to make a competitive environment, then you need to deal with both management of water and energy in a much more sustainable way. Thank you very much to our distinguished panelists. I think we have to move on uh, to the coffee break, so thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you very much for the debate with the uh, public. One more. I think, you, I think uh, one we more have to question, because we're Okay, but late. we're in it. Let's l so one I'll, more question, please. Excuse I'll me. I leave the decision to you. <laughs> Of course, one question. One, uh, to, uh, answering your, your point, we are in a region of sun, and you know, to, we all know that today the biosphere protection is becoming one of the most important things in the world today. What are we doing to develop solar energy in the Middle East, where we have sun more than anybody else in the world? Uh, I was just reporting last week that we are at 10% in terms of final energy consumption uh, when it comes to the uh, renewable energy, uh, and it's moved from 4% in 2014, so already a uh, tremendous effort that was done, and we will see the coming two years, we will see additional capacities that are coming within the, the region. However, the, uh, however uh, yes, you are 
certainly right when we say that we have tremendous potential, but renewable energy is not uh, well considered in terms of uh, energy use. Uh, but this, I will return back to the business model and the governance that we have. You cannot develop the renewable energy if you don't have the right involved in the private sector. You have the right business model in terms of financing, and it's not there yet, including in the, in the country where we are. Juste un complément aussi pour rebondir ce que Radia a dit. Il va falloir investir dans la recherche pour le stockage des énergies renouvelables. Car le problème majeur, c'est en fait l'efficacité des panneaux solaires qui sont liés au stockage. Donc il vaut mieux maintenant une recommandation que les pays arabes investissent dans la recherche. Ça c'est très important. Au lieu, au lieu d'investir dans d'autres choses. Ils investissent dans la recherche. Uh, 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 Rifkin, Rifkin is talking uh, about... We have to go for the coffee break because His we Excellency, the Minister Mulla, is on his way in five minutes. So at least to give you some time to break for five minutes, please. Un panel passionnant.